My name is Martin Halbert. I'm the NSF Science Advisor for Public Access. Um, I'm delighted to introduce this session uh, about the Federal Year of Open Science. Um, we have four presenters on this panel. We'll be, we're going to reserve some time for questions, Q&A at the end. Um, our first presenter is Miriam zaring Hollam from the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Um, so, did that do it? No. Yep, it did. Oh, it did. Okay, great. There's just a bit of a lag. Okay, I'll bring this down to my level. Uh, so, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Miriam Zeringham, and I am the Assistant Director for Public Access and Research Policy at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, or OSTP, uh, for those who like acronyms. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with OSTP, our mission includes providing science and technology advice to the Executive Office of the President and working with our very great federal partners, including those uh, here on this panel uh, with us today, um, as well as with Congress to create bold visions, wise policies, and effective, equitable programs for science and technology. Now, my work at OSTP centers on advancing the Biden-Harris administration's commitment to providing public access to data, publications, and the other important research products of the nation's taxpayer-supported research and development enterprise. So we're here today to talk to you about the 2023 Federal Year of Open Science, which officially kicked off, as many years do, in January with a slate of actions from federal agencies to advance open and equitable research. In total, 17 federal agencies and departments, as well as OSTP, signed on to this effort with other agencies contributing to our discussions and activities through the National Science and Technology Council's Subcommittee on Open Science, which is made up of representatives from across the US government. So the year kicked off with the unveiling of a US government-wide definition for open science, which was developed by a team of agency representatives through that subcommittee on open science to really anchor and root us in a common understanding of open science and what we're trying to achieve through open science. So collectively, we've defined it as the principle and practice of making research products and processes available to all while respecting uh, diverse cultures, maintaining security and privacy, and fostering collaborations, reproducibility, and equity. Now this definition is doing a whole lot of work braiding together uh, the administration's priorities and aspirations around advancing a vision for science and for research more broadly. So it first leads with this commitment to enhancing access to the products and processes of research, which is really foundational to all of the definitions of open science that we came across and that informed our own definition here. It's inclusive, noting that these research outputs must be made equitably available to all, whether we're thinking about researchers, students, policymakers, community advocates, professors, some, uh, small business owners, or other members of the broader public. The definition also notes the need for members of this open science enterprise to respect diverse cultures in their pursuit instilling a sense of curiosity and humility while reinforcing that inclusive spirit. It also uh, centers need, the need for considerations around security and privacy when making decisions around what can and should be shared broadly. And it ends by looking towards the outcomes of open science. What are we aspiring towards? namely opening up more opportunities for collaborations with diverse stakeholders across all of society, enhancing reproducibility by increasing access to the data and tools underlying research findings, and supporting equitable access to those findings. Now, if we look to the administration's aspirations from curbing greenhouse gas emissions to reducing social inequalities to ending cancer as we know it, these all while driving equitable outcomes for all across our nation, bolstering public trust in science and in research and strengthening our decision-making abilities. 
These are really complex and multifaceted challenges that require a diverse and collaborative knowledge base. And so advancing open science policies is really critical to realizing these aspirations and to ensuring that all of America can participate in, contribute to, and benefit from science and technology. So you can learn more about all of the great work that has been happening across the federal government in this last year if you go to open.science.gov. But for now, for, I'm gonna do a very quick uh, year in review recap um, of some of the activities that have been going on at agencies other than those represented on this great panel here. So we can generally organize uh, these activities and initiatives that have been advanced in this past year into five overarching themes. I'm sure you could reorganize them in a different way, but this is how I've sorted them in my mind. So we have policy development to advance the practice of open science and ensure the benefits of government-funded research can extend to all. We have infrastructure developments uh, or enhancements to enable that access. In a, manner, in a manner that is equitable and secure. There is opportunities for training and capacity development to promote a workforce that, contribute to, that can contribute to and advance open research. We have opportunities for community engagement to broaden participation in open science. And then we're also thinking about promoting incentives for advancing open research practices so that this important work is recognized and rewarded. So starting with that first sort of bucket of activities, the, the 2023 Year of Open Science, of course, comes on the heels of OSTP's 2022 memorandum titled Ensuring Free, Immediate, and Equitable Access to Federally Funded Research. Now this memo builds on and strengthens the public access guidance that was issued uh, a decade before by OSTP in 2013. So the driving principle motivating the updated policy guidance can be summed up in the memo itself, where it says that American investment in such research is essential to the health, economic prosperity, and well-being of the nation. There should be no delay between taxpayers and the returns on their investments in research. So since the memo was issued, we have been really hard at work across the entire government, coordinating and collaborating with our great agency partners around its implementation. Agencies with over 100 million in annual research and development expenditures who were originally covered by the 2013 memo uh, submitted their updated public access plans to OSTP and OMB for review in February 2023. After our review, a number of those agencies have made their, including NSF, uh, have made their plans uh, for policy development publicly available. And you can find those updated plans if you go to uh, organized on science.gov. And newly covered agencies, uh, specifically those with research and development expenditures below 100 million, were given more time to develop their public access plans for the first time. They submitted their plans to us uh, in August, and we've been working with them since then um, to get those plans finalized and translated into policies. Now, of course, the celebration of the Year of Open Science goes beyond public access. A key point, um, in a key factor in enabling open, equitable, and secure access to research outputs is ensuring that we have robust infrastructure. So we have uh, activities like CDC that has launched its data modernization initiative, adopting innovative data systems that get information to CDC and the public quickly and accurately. We also have the Department of Energy, which launched uh, PIDS at OSTI.gov, which is a website, um, that provides uh, streamlined and unified access for its persistent identifier services. Agencies have also worked to support and sustain a community of open science practitioners through various um, training and capacity development activities. So just last week, NASA's Transform to Open Science program released their Open Science 101 curriculum, which introduces uh, 
those beginning their open science journey to important definitions, tools, and resources, and provides participants at all levels recommendations on best practices. So you can head on over to that website and access that, that um, really wonderful training opportunity there. Uh, in addition, NIST released version 1.5 of its research data framework, or the RDAF, which is a resource that maps out the research data space and provides a dynamic guide for various stakeholders to understand best practices, costs, and benefits for research data management and dissemination. The RDAF has been developed through really extensive uh, community engagement, including a plenary that was hosted earlier this fall and a request for information that was released over the summer to get that really important input from the community. In addition to training those who are already interested and engaged in open science, agencies have created engagement opportunities aimed at broadening participation in open science, reaching out to those who we maybe traditionally haven't reached out to in the past. So these activities include continuing long-standing programs like the US Geological Survey's Community for Data Integration, which is a community of practice working to grow USGS's knowledge and capacity in scientific data and information management and integration. We also have activities that have been aimed at understanding the needs of those who would like to become more active in the open science space. So over the summer, OSTP hosted a series of four listening sessions on advancing a future of open science, centering the needs of the early career researcher community um, and there were a number of key themes that emerged from this session that might be of interest to you all, and we've been sort of noodling them in the interagency space. Um, th what the first is that early career researchers have really long been at the forefront of the open science movement, that a future of equitable open science requires recognizing and addressing uneven access to open science infrastructures, expertise, training, and funding, and that rewarding the sharing of research outputs beyond publications like scientific data and code is really critical to incentivizing open science practices and public access policies. Which brings us to our final sort of bucket of activities, which is you know, thinking about how can we incentivize the practice of open science? So in addition to creating funding opportunities and, and investments uh, through various activities that I touched on over the course of my uh, remarks to you all, uh, we've thought about how to spotlight stories of open science success. How can we sort of uh, shine a light on these great exemplars that have been happening for quite some time, well before the 2023 year of open science? So in September, we launched the White House uh, OSTP Year of Open Science Recognition Challenge, partnering with a number of agencies to promote the challenge. We invited researchers, community scientists, educators, innovators, and other members of the broader public to share stories of how they've advanced equitable open science. And the goal is again to spotlight the stories and the teams behind the projects that have advanced a particular challenge or addressed uh, or, or um, given us a solution to a challenging problem while embodying the principles of open science. And by highlighting the transformative impact of open science on society, these stories can inspire others to contribute to this movement as the US government continues from a year of open science and into a future of open, equitable, and secure research. And so with that, uh, we're thinking about that quite a bit today. We've been talking about a year of open science. 2023 is a year. But how can we move from that, you know, all of the great progress that we've made, sustain this momentum into a future of, of open science? And so with that, I will turn it over to my fellow federal colleagues um, to share in more detail what they have gotten underway. Thank you for your, for your attention. Our plan is to reserve uh, group time for Q and A at the at the end of this. Um, what uh, I'm going to have more of a um, off the cuff set of remarks, namely so that I can speak to this a newly revamped interface to the science.gov site. Um, the um, agencies that are listed as collaborating in the year of open science. 
uh, are a subset of a larger group of federal agencies that uh, participate in a number of uh, subcommittee efforts of the National Science and Technology Council, namely the Subcommittee on Open Science. Um, this particular group, the Year of Open Science uh, group, is a sub um, set of those agencies that agreed to participate in this as a formal effort this year and perhaps going forward, as Miriam has suggested. Um, and the um, one of the there's we see a lot of utility in the year of open science activity. One of the uh, things that has been exciting about it is that it uh, provided an external outreach kind of activity uh, as a lens into the work of this very ac very active uh, subcommittee on open science within the federal space. So we hope through this science.gov site, and specifically the open science.gov portion of it, to provide more of a, uh, a window into these activities, into the uh, very sort of active space of, of collaboration here. So what I'm gonna do is just uh, narrate some of the features of this newly uh, updated site, and, um, and kind of use that as a mechanism to say a few words about NSF's activities. Um, the, um, you'll see this drop down that provides a, uh, a number of, of windows into that space. Let me just go into the subsite. If I can get to it, if I can see. Hopefully this is still open, yep, okay. So this is just a, a list of agencies and uh, sort of the, this preserves a lot of the information that was on the prior site which was a lot sort of blander, sort of more of a traditional 1990s kind of website. We just tried to update it with a few content management sorts of functions. Um, but the, um, the uh, let's see, I wanna go first to this one, which is a list of, a lot of people were asking us, where can we see the new public access plans and guidance that are coming out of these agencies? So we made this special uh, page that has expansion points for all of the different agencies that are working in this space. So let me use NSF as an example. If you click on the uh, expand button here, you're gonna see three key links to NSF resources. First, let me, what's labeled here, additional guidance on NSF public access. This is the NSF public access initiative site. So in other words, the agency web page that provides information on what we're doing in the area of open science. Uh, NSF has done, for example, a lot of public engagements. This was one we were very pleased in the uh, results. Um, how can public access advance equity and learning? It was a, a joint webinar that we did with AAAS. Uh, and the recordings to all of these, all of the sessions within that site are all provided there so you can go and watch those. This was a, a particularly, I think, uh, I, I learned a lot in that session because it featured not only the federal agency presentations, uh, not just NS, NSF, but also NASA, NIH, DOE, uh, and also junior researchers and people that coordinate programs for early career researchers that uh, I found very catalytic in their uh, perspectives, their uh, observations on where they see public access going in the future. So I, I would direct you to, if you wanna see some of our uh, external public engagements that have been recorded, go to this site. We have a link to a number of other NSF public engagements that we uh, undertook to get feedback as we were planning on the release of our public access, our new our public access plan 2.0. And you can read all about that there, as well as um, a lot of other information that about internal agency guidance from our different directorates. Um, other features, and I'm trying to keep my comments short so we have time for our other presenters. Um, the other links here are one to our original public access plan excuse me, 
from in response to the Holden Memorandum of 2013. This was NSF's first public access plan, 2015, today's data, tomorrow's discoveries, and was the inception point of our response to the Holden Memorandum and how we set everything up. The other uh, item to, that is linked out here is, of course, our second public access plan, something that took up a lot of my time over the last uh, year and a half. And uh, you can read about our how we are updating and planning to implement, and as it says here, um, undertake the activity of ensuring open, immediate, and equitable access to National Science Foundation-funded research. So this website will hopefully provide a lot of information in addition to these basic core links to our agencies. Um, we've got this section, which provides a, uh, a mechanism, again, for outreach and announcements from different agencies about uh, new developments in the, uh, the space of, of, of this, um, this undertaking. So with that, let me uh, quickly transition then. And there's more stuff on here if you want to, you know, I would encourage everybody to browse through this thing. Um, let me transition to Brett Bobley, and he's going to tell you about what N NEH is doing. Let's see if I can get you queued up. Hello, folks. Very good to be here today. Um, you know, as Martin indicated, um, they NSF has just come out with their 2.0 version of their public access plan. Um, NEH is one of the agencies that, one of the new agencies that is just working on their very first public access plan right now. So I can't tell you how excited I am to, to have the, to, to be able to tell you that today. Um, I've been working on trying to get the NEH to have a public access plan for a couple of decades now. Um, things move a little slowly in government. Um, but thank, thank goodness for that memo from OSCP. Thank you, uh, Miriam. Thank you, Alondra Nelson, wherever you are today. Um, you know, right now, we have this unusual situation, right, where if, for example, an historian of science were to get a grant from the NSF and publish a paper, that paper would be subject to, to public access. If that exact same historian got a grant from, N from NEH, they would not. They would not have to publish it in a, in a public access forum. And, you know, that, that to me is very problematic. You know, I, I remember a couple of years ago, a librarian, a university librarian was talking to them, and, and they said to me, Brett, are we getting to a point where all science is going to be open, uh, all the scientific disciplines, but all the humanities disciplines are going to be behind paywalls. And that was very concerning to me because I, I feel like what we don't need is even more people feeling that humanities research is irrelevant to, to, to the conversations in the world today. Because I think it's extremely relevant to a lot of the issues we have today. And I think that treating humanities research like it's something completely different from, the, from, from disciplinary research in the sciences is, is, is a bad idea. So I'm very, very pleased that the NEH is moving toward a, a public access plan. So let me tell you a little bit about it. Um, first of all, let me note, you know, public access really has been central to our mission at the NEH for a very long time. I mean, um, even in our founding legislation back in the 60s, um, we talked about the fact that public funds provided by the federal government must ultimately serve public purposes we funded a zillion things, as you many, many of you know, like the National Digital Newspaper Project, which is a giant open, open project. Um, in fact, for over 20 years, our, our grant guidelines have even stated that all other considerations being equal, NEH gives preference to projects that provide free access to the public. So this is very much in our DNA, but we've never had a formal public access plan um, similar to what the other agencies have now. So as per the 2022, the Nelson memo that came out from OSTP, we are now working with our many other agencies and with OSTP to try to put together our own plan. Uh, we have a draft plan already, um, and we're kind of embarking on a tour. This is day one of the tour, by the way, to tell you all, <laughs> to tell you all that we're working on this thing. Um, so congratulations, you get to hear it before anyone else. You can, it's breaking news. Um, but anyway, we're, we're, we're working on that right now, and I, I can tell you that um, one of the keys to our plan 
is to not be special for snowflakes. We want our plan to be very similar to what you're going to find at NSF or NIH because we have the same applicants. Our researchers are mostly people from universities, and we don't want universities to have to have a completely different set of rules for the NEH than they would for NSF or NIH or whatever. So um, we're endeavoring to make our plan requirements easy, simple, very similar to what you're already familiar with if you ever get a grant from NSF or, or, or another federal agency. And we're working closely with, with other agencies and with OSTP to try to make it as smooth as possible. Um, there are two key points to the public access plan. And if you've read the Nelson memo, this is not a surprise to you. But in a nutshell, if you are a researcher and you get a grant from the NEH and you publish a peer-reviewed journal article, you will need to send a copy of that peer-reviewed journal article, the um, manuscript to the NEH where we will put it into a designated repository. So similar to like PubMed or something like that or the NSF PAR, we're going to have a designated repository where we will have a copy of peer-reviewed articles that were funded, uh, where the, research, the underlying research was funded by the NEH. So that's pretty, pretty straightforward. Again, very similar to what you're already familiar with. Um, again, it's specifically about peer-reviewed journal articles. It doesn't impact, you know, NEH funds lots of other things. It doesn't affect like museum exhibitions we fund or monographs that we fund or, or f films that we fund. This is really about peer-reviewed journal articles. And the other portion, of course, from the Nelson memo, it has to do with scientific data sets, right? If you, for example, get a grant, you create a, a scientific data set that maybe undergirds your peer-reviewed journal article, you have to... Uh, you have to describe to the NEH some kind of a data management and sharing plan to preserve that data and make it openly available to the public. Now, because of the nature of the humanities, we don't fund a lot of scientific um, uh, um, re data sets, so that's not as nearly as common for the NEH uh, researchers as it would be at, at NSF or NIH. But nevertheless, we will be making changes to our NOFOs, our grant guidelines, to ensure that if you are one of those grantees that does create a, a data set, that you have a plan in place for, for preserving it and making it available to the public, OK? Um, you know, as I, as I noted earlier, we don't just fund R&D. We fund lots of other things at the NEH, public programming, education, et cetera. Um, so for, for people, if, you're the, if your organization applies to the NEH to make documentary films, for example, the public access plan may not have much of an impact on you. This is more about the researchers that are applying to the NEH. And you'll see that in our plan, but that, it, it's really mainly about, about research. Okay. Um, here's our timeline, which again, taken straight out of the memo, really. Um, we, back on August 20th, we submitted our draft plan to Maryam and her colleagues at OSTP. Um, we are starting our listening tour. Oh, that's today, by the way. Today's our listening tour. So we're gonna be going around and talking to people, letting people know about our new plan, answering questions, that kind of a thing. Um, December 31st, 2024 is our deadline for publishing the actual policies that kind of undergird the, the plan itself. Um, we're going to hope it, to roll out our designated repository in 2025, and then the, the ultimate, ultimate deadline um, for the new policies to be effective is December 31st. I hope we're going to actually get it done before that, but those are the official deadlines. So, okay. Um, the public access Point of contacts at the NEH is me and my colleague, Chris Thornton. Chris is the director of our division of research. Feel free to get in touch with us at any time if you have any questions whatsoever. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right, great. Hi, everyone. My name is Ashley Sands, and I'm a senior program officer at IMLS, the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Um, and since this is CNI, I will first say, if you don't know what IMLS is, then let's definitely chat right after this session. Um, but I, because I'm going to proceed as though you're fairly familiar with IMLS. Um, and again, if not, we talk now. <laughs> um, also, I, I do want to hit on something that Brett was just saying that, um, you know, while we're while we all made a different public access plan, we do hope that they're fairly consistent, right? We, it's not supposed to be some kind of trickery that your institutions have to memorize all these different things. It's just within each context, there really are, are distinctions that, and I'll give some examples of the kinds of decisions that need to be made based on the context of each institution. You've already heard Brett already talk about, you know, what are you gonna do with monographs are not, are not the same as um, 
peer-reviewed scholarly publications, that kind of a thing. So some things are different and some things are the same. Um, and one of the things that's also the same is our listening tour starts today. Um, so great to see you and um, hopefully hear, hear from you all again in the future as we kind of proceed down this um, draft. Um, so IMLS is also one of those smaller agencies that was not required to develop a plan under the 2013 OSTP memo. Um, R&D expenditures are way less than $100 million annually. However, because we're part of your community, um, we've always had a commitment to openness at the agency, supporting libraries, archives, and museums. Um, and so, in fact, in, Septem um, in September of 2013, began work in order to create the increasing access to the results of IMLS and IMLS funded research and data. Now that's an internal document, that so you haven't seen that, but what you have seen is the policy, the policy text that came from that plan. And those have been in our general terms and conditions for the awards that I'm seeing many familiar faces that hopefully you've all read. Um, so, you can see that there is text, the text has been in there to encourage you to be sharing these materials over the years. So there's two parts, right? Articles, peer review journal articles. So this is actually from our current terms and conditions. Um, we expect you to ensure that final peer reviewed manuscripts resulting from research conducted under this award are made available in a manner that permits the public. Um, in fact, you must provide IMLS at least one copy of any printed or physical distributable products, also electronic ones. I do like every now and then I get something in the mail of a printed report, which is kind of fun. Um, you'll see that there's lovely words like, we expect you to. So there's, there's less teeth that have been in these general terms and conditions than there will be once the new memo takes into place. So we just talked about journal articles for a second there. Now let's talk about the data component of the memo. Again, here's what's, here's what's already here. Data resulting from our funded research needs to be in a broadly accessible repository. I will note that right now it says no later than the date upon which you submit your final report to IMLS. Um, and I underlined that as a consideration of immediate. So immediate is gonna be a, is a requirement in the new memo. What does immediate mean? Is, are we gonna retain that same definition? Is immediate like, as soon as you hear that um, you're accepted, you're like, ah, quick, put it in the repository, that kind of thing. So that's just an example of um, the things that actually need to be worked out individually at each agency and why, you know, on the surface, coming up with these public access plans may be simple. Just say what, do what it says in the memo. There's actually a lot to be clarified. Um, and as always, we have allowed you to include the cost of getting the, the data or articles ready for public release or if there's any cost to continuing to make them available. All right, so that was the where we're at. Now, where's, where are we going? We do not have a public version of our public access plan yet, which um, now that I think about it is something we need to remedy shortly. Um, but I wanted to share the thinking and planning that we've been doing over this uh, more than a year since the memo came out. Um, also, a really quick side note, we do have some internal research done at IMLS, and they are also subject to this memo. But you all, you, our colleagues here, are interested in the requirements for the externally funded research. So we're going to talk more about that. So here's something that Brett was just kind of talking about, the distinction between what's required in the memo and what's recommended in the memo, or what we feel us, our community, is recommending. So these peer-reviewed research publications, again, are, gonna, are required. These need to be made open. And again, for data, it's the data underlying those peer-reviewed research publications. Um, but IMLS, we support so many different other kinds of grant deliverables um, in addition to these kinds. So a big consideration at the agency right now is how do we take the important steps necessary to meet the OSTP requirements, but how can we also use this as a time to kind of the impetus to be able to help make other kinds of grant deliverables more findable, more findable, accessible, reusable. I, I keep thinking maybe not quite 
fair at the moment. I don't know about interoperable, but I'm gonna say we're gonna go far instead of fair. I, that's all I can, that's all I, I'm going with it. I'm going with it. So, so, so again, where are we going and what are we working on? Um, the next steps, we are going to be convening internal working groups, again, to come up with these specifics for IMLS. So we need to define and operationalize some of these terms. I already mentioned immediate. What does immediate deposit mean? We need to operationalize that. Does it, is that the end of the grant period perform out, performance before closeout? Again, the second that you get the acceptance letter. Um, we also need to operationalize research. Um, what does it mean to if you do a research study? If you check the planning grant box, does that count as research if you have research questions? Um, how are we defining that? You know, we have we have ways that we kind of define those right now, but are, do those need to adapt as we go into this, um, as, as we move forward past the memo? Um, you know, other good things. How are program officers going to monitor compliance? Everybody's favorite things, you know, the whole, will there be carrots, will there be sticks? How, can we make this beautifully integrated into our current uh, EGMS reach, our content management system? Things that, again, behind the scenes we're, we're trying to do, I promise we're trying to do for you all to make it easier so you don't have to do something completely unique at each agency. Um, I, again, our listening tour is starting now, but we, um, OSTP, Miriam and her colleagues have already held a couple of um, calls that she's, she's mentioned previously and we were able to sit in on those, so it's not the first time we're even considering um, what y'all have to say. We're very interested and eager to continue to learn more. I do want to just really briefly mention two really important um, awards that we made over the summer that are particularly relevant to this year of open science and kind of one of the, we'll say that's one of the ways we celebrated the year of open science at IMLS. Um, in fact, I believe your, your colleagues for both these awards are, are in, the, um, in the building, if not in the room. Um, so the California Digital Library from CDL and the UC Office of the President actually has been working with ARL in order to address the urgent needs of you all, of various sized institutions, to respond to these increased requirements to share this federally funded data. So they're gonna be enhancing the DMP tool, um, including with persistent identifier registries to meet these, again, these evolving funder mandates. Um, so they're heading towards machine actionable data management plans. Very excited about that. Again, you'll, you'll see your, co your colleagues here if you wanna hear more about that. Also, an ARL has been leading this other initiative um, through a number of institutions with the Data Curation Network. Um, they are going to conduct research on the economics of investments in public access to research data. Um, we all love the term unfunded mandate. Well, these folks are gonna take a look and see exactly how much is it costing you all at your libraries or at your institutions, largely through some surveys and interviews, get a better sense of um, the expense and service models to allow this public access to research data to happen. Um, again, my name is Ashley. I'm hoping this is the start of our conversation and um, looking forward to discussing that further, but otherwise we will take some questions and answers from the panel. <laughs>